Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to, uh, I think I've lost count of the number of lectures we've done in the Rethinking Open Society series. Um, I see many hardened veterans of this series returning. I'm delighted to see you here. Uh, I'm delighted also that we have um, both uh, diplomatic representation, as we've had in the past, and I welcome uh, representatives from uh, the diplomatic missions in Budapest. I, but I particularly want to welcome uh, colleagues that we have from the Open Society Foundations, and also particular welcome to uh, foundations and organizations working on migration issues in Hungary. It's tough to work on these issues here in this country. I hardly need to describe this. But we have people from MIG Help, we have people from the Cordelia Foundation, we have people from the Helsinki Committee, we have a very distinguished Hungarian expert on migration, Attila Meleg, who's here from the Corvinus and from the Institute of Demography there, and we have our very own and much admired and respected uh, Prem uh, Rajran, who does our OLIVE program, which provides uh, uh, refugee uh, and migrant education at CU. And we're darn proud of that program and darn proud of the work that he and his team do. Uh, and I think some there may be people in the room who are involved in that program. And um, we're not backing down. It's a priority for this university. Um, and so I want to send an especially warm welcome to those NGOs and foundations who work on these issues in Hungary. We stand with you 100%. Um, let me uh, make, a, make an obvious remark, which is that there is no challenge to the idea of open society more controversial and more fundamental than the issue of migration and borders. This is where the open society ideal is under most direct pressure. Can you have an open society, that is a liberal democratic society based on freedom, constitutional law, rule of law, that also at the same time has a migration policy and a refugee policy that is one consistent with international law, uh, provides uh, secure borders for population, provides at the same time lawful means of access to countries, a lawful migration stream uh, that provides, uh, if necessary, lawful repatriation when those rules are broken, that provides an integration strategy so that strangers become citizens and friends and neighbors instead of being excluded? Can we have a policy that um, replaces the deliberate cultivation of hatred, fear, and paranoia with a policy of welcome, solidarity, uh, friendship, and integration into a common civic project? So this session is about the very core of the challenge to open society, and I hope we'll discuss this actively uh, in our discussion afterwards. We have a wonderful person to uh, lead us into the discussion. Uh, Jacqueline Baba is an extremely distinguished, internationally recognized <coughs> expert on migration and refugee issues. Uh, she's a lawyer and has made a full recovery from this initial condition. Uh, I love jokes at the expense of lawyers. In fact, Jackie has been a human rights lawyer all her life and has represented the absolute best of the legal profession. She's director of research at uh, the Harvard School of Public Health. She's a lecturer in law at the Harvard Law School. She's also a lecturer in public policy at an institution I know well, the Harvard Kennedy School. She was formerly the director of the Human Rights Program at the University of Chicago. And she's just 
written a book called Can We Solve the Refugee and Migration Crisis or Can We Solve the Migration Crisis, published this year, if I'm right, by Polity, is that mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, her title of her talk will be Can We Solve the Refugee and Migration Crisis? She'll talk for about 40 minutes or so, and then we will have a discussion and the event will end promptly at 7 o'clock. Let's give a warm welcome to Jackie Bond. It's a singular honor to be here at the Central European University today. Um, this admirable and widely admired center, not only of academic excellence, but also of community engagement, evident from the comments that your rector just made. Um, and for me, it's a particular pleasure to be invited by someone who is a friend, a colleague, but maybe most of all a, a public intellectual who, whose work and whose um, clarity of thinking and his integrity I have long admired. So I really could not be more delighted to be here and to take part in a series uh, organized by Michael Ignatieff. I remember when he was at the Kennedy School he achieved the impossible by organizing a seminar on American exceptionalism, which actually got people from across the university to come repeatedly uh, to engage with each other, sort of unprecedented and I think unrepeated since, uh, since he left. So uh, being part of a, a lecture series uh, organized uh, by, by uh, Michael Ignatieff is, is certainly an honor and I'm really delighted to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about the migration policy challenge to open societies and try and give a global perspective. To start with, it's hard to think of a time when public engagement with migration policy globally has been as evident and as polarized as it now is. Um, as we know, migration and migration policy have become central uh, issues, drivers of seismic electoral <coughs> upsets and diplomatic realignment, so much so that we often seem to be at an acute crossroads with virulent nativism and vigorous cosmopolitanism engaging in virtually daily duels on different terrains spanning the globe. Though the former seems to be clearly in the ascendance at the moment, I hope I will be able to persuade you that there really are countervailing and encouraging moves internationally and regionally that are afoot in a robust way that can provide a pathway towards a more rational, just, and inclusive migration policy for all open and democratic societies. But before I do that, let's just consider some examples of the current po polarization to get a sense of how divided the terrain is. As you may well know, over one in ten Germans are engaged daily in some form of support or solidarity activity with some of the million plus newly arrived distressed migrants in their country, um, a transformed quotidian landscape, which was beautifully captured by one of Germany's leading novelists, Jenny Uppenbeck, in her masterpiece, Go Went Gone. But also captured by Deutsche Welle, one of the main uh, uh, news uh, channels, refugee-run Facebook page, which shows the vibrancy of uh, refugee presence in, in the public sphere. But meanwhile, of course, for the first time in 60 years, an openly racist party has entered the Bundestag, having secured large-scale electoral success to become the third largest party in Germany, forcing this, country's mo this, this uh, century's most successful European leader into a precarious coalition to secure her future. And of course, across the ocean, from where I've recently arrived, disagreements over migration are every bit as prominent. Migration policy recently shut down the US government because of political deadlock over the fate of 800,000 undocumented but long resident young residents, so-called the documented. Um, and while the US president flip-flops between sentimental tweets about his affection for, quote, these kids, they're good kids, and blunt denunciations of lawbreakers and cheats echoing the drumbeat of the anti-illegal Republican base, hundreds of mayors and governors across the US 
declare their territories to be sanctuary spaces. Universities waive fees, provide free legal advice and representation to their undocumented students facing legal threats. Families open their homes to at-risk deportees. Weekly demonstrations are occurring at airports and in city centers, broadcasting a message of inclusive solidarity. And in the global south, too, polarization on migration policy is evident. Consider Myanmar, a country newly and warmly welcomed into the sphere of democratic policies, uh, polities, to the point of being a Fulbright scholarship destination state. But consider how it has rapidly returned to being somewhat of a pariah internationally because of its genocidal but domestically widely popular anti-Rohingya policies. Its Nobel awarded leader, has been publicly criticized by no lesser an iconic moral authority than the Pope. But meanwhile, <coughs> fundamentalist Buddhist nativism shows no signs of abating. And so it's been left to Bangladesh, one of the poorest and most overcrowded countries, to host over half a million survivors on top of the hundreds of thousands of Rohingya refugees already living there in camps, while the US and the EU have dramatically failed to offer resettlement opportunities or other forms of robust assistance. And then finally, the exodus of over a million South Sudanese fleeing into Uganda to escape brutal and renewed civil conflict has also precipitated very contrasting reactions. The allocation of arable land to the refugees by a government intent on honoring its humanitarian obligations and avoiding the now three-generation-long destitute aid dependence of Somali refugees in nearby Kenya. But at the same time, the hostility and attacks from impoverished locals. And you see this polarization <laughs> also in South Africa with respect to Zimbabweans, Sudanese, Eritreans, and Ethiopians as the richest sub-Saharan country, long itself dependent on neighbors for refuge during the protracted anti-apartheid struggle now wrestles with the tensions between its solidarity commitments and its economic constraints. And thus it is that brutal attacks on African refugees and migrants have become a daily occurrence in the rainbow country, a remarkable and depressing transformation magnificently captured in Johnny Steinberg's wonderful novel, Man of Good Hope. And the migration challenge, of course, to open societies everywhere is nowhere more evident than in the fractured response to the Syrian refugee crisis. The US, the UK, Australia, and many other key signatories to the UN Refugee Convention have performed extremely poorly, admitting only a few thousand refugees from one of the most dramatic humanitarian debacles of the last century. Meanwhile, as is well known, of course, Turkey has opened its doors to Syrian refugees in the past and now hosts over three million, <coughs> making it the largest refugee host country in the world. Lebanon and Jordan also host large numbers of Syrians. Interestingly, none of these countries have international protection obligations under the Refugee Convention, unlike the US, the UK, and Australia. And so this is another example of how our humanitarian response is not fit for its current purpose, the inefficacy of our current refugee regime. And of course, the oil-rich Arab countries also neighboring the conflict zone, have barely accepted any ref Syrian refugees at all, contenting themselves with financial contributions to the refugee services provided by others, that familiar trope of arm's length assist assistance. These divergent responses reflect... These divergent responses reflect a spectrum of ethical considerations considerations that underpin the polarized and fractured current engagement with migration, but considerations that must inform any alternative policy solution. It's become something of a simplistic truism to say that migration is the moral issue of our time. But while the attention, so in, the intense attention is new, the issues of course are not. The philosopher Henry Hsu pinpointed a key challenge clearly decades ago. He asked, the world is full of foreigners. Most of them are strangers to me. And I have every reason to doubt that most of them have ever given me a thought. Is there some reason I should give a thought to them? Or, to rephrase, what claim, if, if any, to our basic and hard-earned resources do destitute outsiders, 
non-citizens, non-Europeans, non-Christians, we can define them in a variety of ways, what claim, if any, do they have on their host societies? The answer of all the world's major religions is clear, from the Samaritan fable to Old Testament edicts to injunctions in the Quran. We have deep ethical obligations to needy strangers, and yet, and yet, Hungary, I need hardly tell this audience, has discovered itself a deeply Christian country, but paradoxically one with no responsibility for Muslim strangers or needy outsiders. It staunchly refused to accept its share of the European Union determined allocation for resettled refugees, accepting zero out of the mere 1,294 distressed migrant quota allocated by the Commission. And, as I'm sure you all know, it has the lowest acceptance rate of asylum applicants in the EU at less than 1%, with only 106 applicants being granted refugee status in 2017, despite benefiting very handsomely from EU subsidies and capacity building since its accession. <coughs> by erecting fences on its southern borders with Croatia and Serbia, in the space of three months, from September to December 2015, the Hungarian government reduced access to these distressed migrants from, from an average of 7,000 to 10 per day. Of course, these measures did not ex address the extreme humanitarian need of these migrants, or indeed the 411, 515,000 people who'd crossed the external border earlier in 2015, the majority refugees from Syria, Syrian civil war. And no doubt that policy contributed to the stark mortality of distressed migrants forced onto ever more perilous escape routes, a figure that, according to the International Organization for Migration, now exceeds 14,500 migrant deaths in the Mediterranean since 2014, one third of whom were children. Germany and Sweden, by contrast, responded expansively to the humanitarian crisis, particularly after the image of three-year-old Alain Kurdi went viral, though Orban called it blackmail. The moral and political polarities toward the rights and duties <coughs> owed to distressed migrants exist across the globe, and certainly they exist in Asia. By contrast with Bangladesh, Thailand, a far richer country, does not accept Rohingya refugees at all and Malaysia tolerates their irregular residence and highly exploited labor while denying them a formal legal status. So Rohingya families in Malaysia are not eligible for health care or for social services, and their children are not admissible in regular schools. I outline these contrasts to illustrate the spectrum of refugee hosting responses that exist. Legal admission <coughs> and support, <coughs> outright exclusion, legal admission but without support, and de facto acceptance but without the grant of a legal status. These policy responses to the migration challenge, of course, have knock-on effects, spillovers that in turn generate new humanitarian emergencies and new political forces. And at this point, I think it's instructive to consider the impact of the EU-Turkey agreement, because we're celebrating its second anniversary just a couple of days ago, on March 20th, 2016. So what do we learn now, two years on, from this first <coughs> EU migration management <coughs> bilateral agreement? In the face of failure with its relocation policy, Hungary being an obvious example, but one of many, and mounting political, economic, and social pressures in the generous host states, let's call them, of Germany and Sweden, the European Commission crafted a new response to the crisis. In return for effectively stemming the flow of distressed migrants from the Turkish mainland to the Greek islands, the EU would reward Turkey with generous financial assistance for its refugee population and with significant visa liberalization for Turkish citizens seeking EU entry. Eligible asylum seekers still arriving in Greece after March 2016 <coughs> would be returned to Turkey but for each returnee, a refugee hosted by Turkey would be resettled. This EU-Turkey agreement was hailed as a fair and durable solution for managing Europe's crisis. And indeed, this agreement has spawned others modeled on its provisions. But does it provide a blueprint for successfully resolving the challenge? Could the US do the same with Mexico 
Israel with Egypt, Australia with Papua New Guinea. Certainly, by the metric of migrant admissions, the success was immediate and dramatic. Thanks to Turkey's blockade, and thanks, I would say, only to Turkey's blockade, not to other political forces in Europe, between 2015 and 2017, Greece and the frontline EU migration destination, Greece, sorry, the frontline EU migration destination state saw a 97% decrease in arrivals from over 850,000 to under 30,000. But this change, I would argue, merely addressed the most evident symptom, unregulated EU migrant arrivals. A symptom that I would suggest is actually an epiphenomenon of the grave underlying social, economic, and political issues that drive mass distress migration and that need to be attended to. <coughs> These issues remain. The, the EU-Turkey uh, agreement doesn't solve them. And the human rights costs of addressing them have escalated, not decreased, because of the agreement. Let me point to three developments in particular which demonstrate how flawed the policy is as a durable solution. First, the abandonment of relocation as an effective strategy has consigned large areas of Greece to a situation of dangerous chaos. As whole communities on the Greek islands and in inner city, and in inner city neighborhoods in parts of the mainland have been converted to de facto migrant holding areas, severe human rights abuses have become increasingly apparent. <coughs> Camps are dangerously overcrowded, inadequately serviced by sanitation, security or in, inadequately serviced by sanitation, security or basic infrastructure. They are gang-ridden, unaccompanied minors are selling sex and working with drug dealers to secure funding for smugglers to facilitate their onward journey, something that we've actually documented in my center. So in the richest region of the world, thousands of destitute refugees are surviving in muddy tarpaulin tents, relying on sticks to keep their flimsy structures up and on plastic water bottles as fuel. The deal has certainly not alleviated suffering or overcrowding at the southern EU border. It has exacerbated it. Second, the enforced misery and, de and degradation around the refugee camps has, of course, had an inevitable spillover <coughs> effect on the local population. Once generous and compassionate locals have progressively, pro progressively become frustrated, impatient with a lack of political leadership and related failures in outside assistance, intolerant of the growing deterioration of their environment and the continuing maldistribution <coughs> in responsibility for hosting refugees. A similar process is dramatically and tragically evident in southern Italy, and of course it will be in any other places where a disproportionate responsibility is taken. The consequences of a short-sighted, superficial and self-serving agreement, I think, will be felt, and we're beginning to see this, in electoral choices in Europe for decades. Finally, and tragically, the closure of the eastern Mediterranean route via Turkey and Greece has predictably stimulated use of more dangerous, le lengthy and, le and lethal uh, survival itineraries. Libya, lawless, failing and gang-ruled, is now the treacherous holding ground for hundreds of thousands of distressed migrants intent on fleeing conflict, abuse, or a complete absence of prospects at home. EU policy, therefore, has directly forced thousands into contexts where modern-day slavery has been absolutely conclusively documented, where labor and sexual trafficking are rife, and where the extortion of ransom and other forms of exploitation proliferate. So humanitarian organizations are left to organize repatriations back to the sites of conflict, danger, and destitution that spurred the migration in the first place. Exclusionary measures, therefore, that fail to tackle the need for mobility, the desperation for legal exit, the entitlement to humanitarian protection, do not constitute an acceptable answer to the migration challenge. But what alternatives exist? Fortunately, some encouraging moves are unfolding on the international <coughs> arena, a welcome, if belated, acknowledgement of the critical need for a better approach to global <coughs> refugee and migration management. Notable among these moves is the process related to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, the second generation of global development plans, 15-year plans. For the first time ever, 
the SDGs include migration as a consensus target for development. An energetic multilateral process is crafting policy to improve both the refugee and migration systems. And two global compacts, one on refugees and one on migration, are developing a reformed migration management architecture with a more realistic acknowledgement of labor needs and the consequences of responsibilities <coughs> for failing to share what needs to be done. The overarching migration goal is set out in so-called SDG 107, and it calls on the international community and its members to, and I quote, facilitate orderly, safe, regular, and responsible migration and mobility of people. Now, for a start, this goal stands in sharp contrast to the prevailing discourse on migration control and alien exclusion. Migration is established as an asset to be protected by lawful measures rather than a danger to be prevented. There's a collective recognition of the point I just made that most of the attention dedicated to fixing refugee and migration crises has been directed to epiphenomena such as failing border control, smuggler fees, trafficking exploitation, symptoms of what's working rather than to the underlying drivers. And of course these symptoms need attention, but migration, but distressed migration flows cannot be stopped and will not be stopped merely by ever more vigorous border control or humanitarian aid or prosecution of smugglers. The more resilient, healthy and capable migrants will carve out their own legal or life-preserving alternatives. For example, the smuggler price now for a fa Syrian family of four to get from Libya to Northern Europe has mushroomed to about $36,000, a tariff that reflects not only the desperation to flee, but also the inflation caused by the generous contributions of the wealthy Syrian diaspora. So to generate sustainable solutions, we need to probe the drivers of contemporary distress migration. And my sense is that there will be no easy or rapid solutions, but without tackling these underlying, underlying issues, no narrow migration management strategy will generate viable solutions. So let me out outline some of the key issues that we need to bring into the migration conversation. One of the most significant and obvious drivers of distressed migration, of course, is conflict. No amount of managed migration or economic development will prevent outflows of refugees intent on saving their lives. And yet, conflict is increasing, not decreasing. According to the Center for Systemic Peace, while global conflict decreased by 60% between 1991 and the early 2000s, the trend since then has been reversing. Not only the number of wars, but the length of war. Many wars last for long periods of time, exacerbating the impact on affected populations and the size of population outflows. In 2014, the average length of exile for refugees from 33 countries affected by conflict was 25 years. The six-year <coughs> conflict in Syria alone has led to the displacement of over half of the country's 22 million population and over 4 million <coughs> refugees, destabilizing, as we know, the whole region with spillover effects much further afield. And it's not just the number of conflicts nor is it the length of conflicts, it's the concentration of conflicts. Of the refugees and migrants fleeing to Europe in 2016, almost 60% came from the world's top 10 refugee producing countries. So when we talk about the difficulty of sorting out migrants from refugees, we should bear that in mind. Many, a very <coughs> significant proportion of people fleeing, are fleeing from conflict. So reducing conflict is definitely at the top of the list for long-term solutions. Um, and of course, I have no solutions in my pocket, and a detailed examination of this topic is way beyond the scope of what I'm saying today. But the reason I mention it is to show that there are no quick and easy fix solutions without addressing these <coughs> geopolitical factors. With war and brutal conflict raging, people are going to be moving for their lives. Secondly, and closely related to the distress migration consequences of conflict, are those that stem from environmental harms, both natural and man-made. Again, a huge topic which I can't really do justice to. But again, the rate of natural disasters is increasing. 
there were three times as many between 2000 and 2009 as there were between 1980 and 1989. With approximately 200 million people affected each year, the spillover effects on distressed migration are immeasurable. So a whole new architecture of migration management needs to be crafted to address environmental, <coughs> environmentally forced migration, something that is clearly on the UN agenda. Thirdly, of course, both conflict and environmental harms aggravate global inequality, skewing access to survival necessities even more. Economic need and the lack of opportunity for economic advancement, of course, are central drivers that compound other drivers of distressed migration, such as political instability and social and environmental insecurity. <coughs> and we all know that poor and unskilled migrants from the South working in the global North are likely to massively increase their earnings, to earn in a week more than they would make in a month at home. A World Bank study of migrants from Togo to New Zealand, for example, found that the lifetime gain due to migration was at least 237,000 US dollars, even before allowing for non-monetary benefits, such as high quality education and healthcare. A 216% increase in income with a dramatic impact, not only on the migrants' lifestyle, but on the lifestyle of families back home. And we also know, of course, that aid assistance is dwarfed by remittances. 436 billion in remittances in 2014, a figure that is much, much larger than development assistance. What's more, thanks to the proliferation of social media and information technology, this vast disparity in living opportunities and earning possibilities is evident to all, particularly to young people. And so, the lack of economic security in so many migration-generating contexts perpetuates a sense of the urgency for migration. This insecurity and this lack of economic uh, possibility is, of course, a complex phenomenon, a product of unequal trade regimes, onerous debt servicing agreements, circumstances that perpetuate vast inequalities. Again, much bigger factors that I can deal with. But if we don't take seriously these enormous inequalities that push people to improve the quality of their life, no migration policies that we craft are going to be successful and we will continue to face the hardships and the pushes and flows that we've seen recently. As long as these determinants of global disparity are not altered, young people will continue to experience a sense of lack of hope at home and opportunity abroad that renders emigration their default choice. So what do we need? We need well-planned social and economic development. We need more equitable ease. We need fairer tax regimes. We need protection of the rule of law. We good, need good, non-corrupt <coughs> state governments, ultimately leading to more prosperity. We need expanded social protection schemes and a rational and cost-effective way of reducing the pressure to embark on distressed migration. And finally, demography. Demography is also going to <coughs> color this big picture that I'm painting. On current demographic trends, youthful migration will be essential for countries as different as, Ger as Germany, Canada, and Australia. By 2025, nearly a quarter of the European citizenry will be over 65. The increase in the over 85s will be particularly steep. Experts predict that the size of the elderly population in 2060 will be nearly double what it was in 2010. Pronatalist policies have not so far succeeded in reversing this trend, and I think they are unlikely to in future. Demographic changes at the youth end of the spectrum as, are as dramatic as they are at the aging end. Many EU member states have sharply declining birth rates, some well below the rate of replacement. In 2015, the total fertility rate was 1.3 for Spain and 1.4 for Italy. By contrast, in Sudan, for the same period, it was 4.3, and in Somalia, 6.4. With, with zero net increase in migration, the working age population in Europe would drop by 3.5% in 2020 and over the next 
50 years, it would decline by 42 million. Uh, immigration undoubtedly constitutes a valuable asset if properly managed for tackling the dem huge demographic challenges ahead. So a central target of the current multilateral, multilateral, multilateral migration negotiations, as I said, is to facilitate orderly, safe, regular and responsible migration. Clearly, success in realizing this target will depend on extensive political support, something not in evidence at the moment. But this political support itself will depend on vigorous and creative engagement with the many drivers of migration that I've just discussed. The draft compacts on migration and on refugees include many <coughs> good concrete proposals, proposals for stimulating responsibility sharing, for increasing access to legal migration routes for unskilled workers, for building robust alternatives to dangerous irregular mobility. <coughs> they include proposals for rigorous safety nets and for boosting the sense of security of embattled domestic populations. They include measures to improve rescue at sea and to generate consensual exit visas for humanitarian escaping conflict. But as recent European developments have shown, these measures will only be sustainable if they're accompanied by <coughs> effective domestic preparedness that diffuses native resentment and fear with substantial investment in internal provision to accommodate new arrivals and accompany them during the inevitable five to ten year transitional period until they become self-sufficient and contributing members of the society. The Harvard Kennedy School economist Danny Roderick in his new book Straight Talk on Trade, for example, suggests that massive state profits from technological innovations have been handed over free to private enterprise, the Googles and Apples and <coughs> of this world, but that they could be used by states to reverse some of the costs of a more mechanized and technology-driven economy to make trade fairer, to make access to labor more democratically palatable. These are the sorts of ideas, I think, which we really need to seriously consider, not just the, correct, the erection of fences. Perhaps most critically of all, Serious attention needs to be paid to a collective engagement with the needs of the next generation. Kids and young people growing up in situations where the prospects of a rights-filled and rewarding life are more and more elusive. Most central, and this is relevant to us sitting here in this bastion of educational opportunity, most central is the redistribution of educational and employment opportunity. There are a plethora of possibilities. <coughs> demographic shifts, for example, are freeing up educational spaces in many places in the global north, spaces which could well be put to the service of underserved constituencies elsewhere. There are two ways, at least, of doing this. One is by instituting much more capacious educational mobility, not just for wealthy populations, as currently exists, for elites attending boarding schools and high-quality tertiary educational establishments far from home, or for brilliant exceptionally talented students who manage to get the few scholarships there are, but for a much broader range of students. Student <coughs> visas accompanied by foreign aid-funded scholarships or loan schemes could ensure that a very large number of students benefit from educational opportunity, enhancing their prospects of employment, perhaps tied to <coughs> employment opportunities supported by the corporate sector. Development budgets could include earmarked line items for these programs, including injection of scholarship funds for educational institutions in the Global North, a proposal that's actually set out in one of the SDGs, for those of you interested, SDG 4B. And there is actually, this might sound like pie in the sky, but there's an excellent precedent, <coughs> the EU Erasmus program. Established in 1987 and replaced by Erasmus Plus in 2014, as you probably all know, it's been tremendously popular and successful as a student mobility scheme. It's contributed to the creation of some sort of European identity, not hamstrung by nationalist prejudices or cultural insularity. And it's acted as a powerful redistributive mechanism, giving students from poorer countries and poorer backgrounds previously unimaginable opportunities to study in some of the best centers for higher education in, in Europe. In the 30 years that Erasmus has existed, there have been 9 million participants. 
between 2007 and 2013, outward student mobility, for example, doubled in Hungary. <coughs> There's no reason why this magnificent precedent should not be a model for a global Erasmus scheme. After all, European historical enmities, cultural and linguistic differences, say between Turkey and Greece, or Poland and Germany, or Romania and Hungary, have been overcome, and the racial and cultural differences within Europe loomed as large, even as insurmountable, when this scene was set up less than a century ago, as global differences are today. The span of Erasmus with millions of black and Asian Londoners, Turkish Berliners, and Moroccan Parisians covers an area no more culturally, racially, or religiously homogeneous than Europe and the Middle East or Africa combined, or indeed America and Latin America, or Australia and Asia. So that's one strategy. A second set of strategies exists, I think, for realizing the goal of more equal and just educational access and employment opportunity for the next generation. Mobile information technology has, I think, so far been radically underutilized for the equal distribution of quality education. Whereas considerable strides have been made with telemedicine, allowing, for example, severely under-resourced areas such as the West Bank and Gaza, and even war-torn Syria to benefit enormously, little has been done to make the huge educational resources of quality universities, technical and vocational colleges, and other centers of learning more easily accessible to populations of the global south. With many, many tertiary education institutions now developing online MOOCs and other curricular innovations, it seems feasible for relatively low investment <coughs> in programmatic and institutional resources to generate very substantial educational benefit, skill training, and vocational opportunity. And of course, there are many other models, and your rector just mentioned the very impressive Olive program that you have here at CU. It's a wonderful example that could be better emulated. So these are just some ideas, and of course there are many others. But I think none of the many reforms I suggest will fix the refugee and migration crisis alone. In combination, however, I think we can go a very long way to radically reduce the rate of contemporary dis distress migration and its devastating human consequences. Thank you.